All right, all right, all right. You hear that music, you know what time it is, right? It is podcast time. Yes, I know y'all are going crazy in your cars, on your walks, while you're getting your run in, listening to this podcast. So just, you know, I mean, we we love the crowd love. Um, my name is Casey. I serve as one of the pastors of the Avenue Church and host of Good News for Those Who Struggle. This is our podcast, and we've been looking at uh, different mental health issues and things like that. Um, and Today we had to um, we had to call an audible. If you're not a sports person, an audible is when you had a play planned out and then something happens and you got to make adjustments. You gotta you gotta pivot and do something different and unexpected. And so we had a guest, and unfortunately, um, due to some health reasons in her family, she couldn't make it. So we audibled, and um, this is you're you're in for a treat. You're get, you're like. Man, good audible, Casey, uh, because the Lord brought us uh, one of our show's favorites. You know him as, I think, episode three, Mr. John O'Brien. We get, yeah, look at that. It's, it's rowdy in here. It is rowdy in here with John O'Brien. John O'Brien, would you, would you just give us a quick hello and uh, let us know how you're doing? Hey, everybody. Super happy to be here with you tonight. John O'Brien, if you missed uh, his first episode, um, make sure you go back and, and look at that. Uh, John is, um, he and I uh, together uh, were got, got to be co-pastors of the Avenue Church and get it off the ground and going, and uh, his family is such a gift uh, to the Avenue Church, and a big thanks to Joy, who's holding things down uh, at home right now, so um, appreciate uh, you allowing uh, John to be able to be here and, and share with us today. Um, and so a uh, couple of things John brings, um, and you, he shared uh, part of his story last time, but John comes from um, the world of addiction and uh, has uh, many years of sobriety now and has uh, worked in that world and really has helped to shape uh, the culture of the Avenue Church in, I think, a, a really beautiful gospel blend of what the recovery community has taught him, and uh, how Jesus has met him in all of that. And so it's been really transformative uh, for us at the Avenue Church and a big part of why we are um, who we are. And that's actually our topic today. We're going to do a bit of a deep dive today in addiction. It's what we're going to be looking at Sunday in the message. And so I am I'm just grateful for you guys and for myself uh, to be able to have John with us today. I'm going to start us off with a scripture, and then uh, we're going to look at uh, three kind of ideas here today. The the problem of, uh, of addiction, um, the solution, and then, uh, and then a plan of attack. And, uh, so let's just start off here. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm in Luke 4, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he, Jesus, rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So, John, before we kind of hop down the the uh, the lane of addiction and talk about like what it is and solution, problem, all those sort of things, tell me, what is, how does the Lord move in you? Where does your mind go just from that particular passage when Jesus is um, proclaiming to be the one who, who liberates the captives? My immediate reaction is just uh, wonder and gratitude because um, addiction is a banquet in the grave, as one person's put it. So there's an element of feasting but it's taking away your life. And um, so to be liberated from addiction into a greater satisfaction, a greater fulfillment, a greater pleasure, a greater joy, Mm -hmm. a greater love is uh, unspeakably precious. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, uh, yeah, there's nothing like it. I love it. So it's it's almost like, I mean, if I'm hearing you correct, it's, it's like, it's not bad that you have the appetite and the craving and the desire. It's just that Jesus has something better. 
than, than what you've been going after. Yeah, the amazing thing is realizing that our desires are not too strong. Uh-huh. As C.S. Lewis said, right. they're too weak. Yeah. We're half-hearted creatures that are content with mud pies, like a child playing with mud in a slum, mm-hmm. when the invitation is to enjoy a holiday at the sea. Yeah, yeah. And what um, seems to be, uh, I think, some of the issue is we so we hear that and it feels like we're on such slippery sl- like a slippery slope when we when we try to to get there on our own we try our like our our best sort of um self-motivated efforts and things like that and so um man i love that invitation but what i love about today is going to be um a, an actual plan of action to to get there and to see to see kind of like what that might look like so let's let's look at this systematically let's just hop in problem what is addiction and then you know we'll get into a little bit of how how does it work sure so um a word about me just to give me some authority to address this subject uh tomorrow will be 21 years clean from drugs and alcohol come on Oh my goodness, that is that's like legit applause. That's not like, I mean that that deserves legit stuff. And um, you know, uh, twenty one years ago, I was in my thirteenth program mm. uh, for uh, drugs, substance abuse, and um, I had been in the program for six months, mm. and uh, I just had attended uh, an award ceremony for some of the kids that were, you know, doing well, and I was still messing up. I was still not advancing or progressing, and I remember my mom crying and saying, "I just wish I could be proud of my son for something." And she didn't know I heard her say that, but mm. I was like, "Ah, oh. mm. you know, like I, I'm just harming people around me, um, and this is me trying my best." You know, um, Mm -hmm. and I remember thinking, like, what can I do? Because I had been told by many people at this program that I was more hard off than they were. And these were people who had grown up on the streets of New York or other big cities who had been sexually abused or uh, assaulted, who had just come from horrible backgrounds. I grew up in a beautiful neighborhood with loving Christian parents Mm -hmm. and had everything not just offered to me, but pushed at me and yet I was so self-destructive and so why couldn't I reform Mm -hmm. myself why couldn't I change and um so I was really determined again like I'm gonna you know make my mom proud of me for something and I just couldn't make progress and then two kids I really looked up to left the program one relapsed and died and then the other uh, actually there was two came back to speak at a another award thing Mm -hmm. um and both had relapsed, and one of them was high when he was speaking and pretending to have, you know, reformed his life. And these and, were all supposed to be all stars. Yeah, the program. Yeah, and uh, when I left the program, um, out of sixty or s- more kids that I was there with, only one other one besides me didn't relapse. Um, wow. Out of all of them, wow. And twenty-one years tomorrow. So when I saw these people leaving and dying and relapsing and the ones I looked up to the most, I thought, I am screwed. <laughs> right, right. I'm yeah. screwed. Yeah. Like, I'm not no even, shot. No I'm shot. No shot at all. And um, that's when Jesus intervened. Because when you are hopeless from the world's perspective, when you are destitute and lost from your own perspective, mm-hmm. when you have no other option, wow. Jesus is enough. Wow. And so I'm here to encourage anyone here today who's listening and thinks that they're too far gone, Mm -hmm. they're too bad, too messed up, too broken, uh, Jesus is enough. He's inviting you, come to me, and I will give you rest. I will liberate you and make you a freedom fighter and Uh one who mobilizes and frees others to start a culture of freedom. And that is so powerful that it was um, at your moment of desperation that Jesus began to enter into that and really bring about that healing that you had you had desperately wanted, but it seemed like you were now at, at a posture where Jesus could could get in and do what he needed to do. Is that fair? It is. It is. And and would you say I, I love the term gift of desperation, right? And so part of part of my thought here is it's one thing to have the gift of desperation, but you need to 
you need to make sure who you give it to, right? So once you, once a person has the gift of desperation, that's one thing. It's another thing to then turn and, and give that to Jesus and allow Jesus to, to come into that context. So and that, that, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that story. Amen. Amen. Just in that, I'm I'm just like I'm filled. Just in that, right there, that is a, that is a beautiful. Um, beginning to to where we're going to head. So this is John. That's his story. Um, he, he might weave other parts in it uh, as well. Uh, but we're so so. Talk talk to us about addiction. What is it? And then we're going to, to take a look at some of the maybe the mechanics of how it works against us. Sure. So I think it's fair to say that our culture um, has a, uh, for lack of a better word, reductive physiological viewpoint on addiction okay. it's uh you know nature has loaded the gun mm-hmm. uh view mm-hmm. um nature versus nurture more balanced people will say yes uh nature may have loaded the gun but we pulled the trigger so mm-hmm. when it, in any discussion of addiction uh, we need to address it holistically we okay. need to um examine it holistically and uh so even here, looking at it, we'll we'll talk about it from a, a secular world perspective definition, and then we'll contrast it with a more biblical idea, and then mm-hmm. we'll um, move away from there. So here's an, a definition from ASAM, American Society Addiction something. Okay. Um, but ASAM, look like, it up. Yeah. A, <laughs> prim- it up. <laughs> a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. There's actually a lot of strengths in this definition, Mm -hmm. but one thing I want to highlight is that explanations are signposts to solutions. Okay. I'm going to say that again. Explanations are signposts to solutions. So when we define addiction Mm -hmm. as primarily a primary chronic disease, Mm -hmm. already that's setting the course for what is the solution. Because when you diagnose something already you're moving in the direction sure. of a solution. And so this is highlighting that that hereditary predisposition to mm-hmm. addiction, that some mm-hmm. of us who have been born into families with addictive histories mm-hmm. have uh, very easy to uh, demonstrate um, a predisposition to sure. addiction. So sure. this is that hereditary aspect Mm -hmm. the nature versus nurture uh, emphasis and um that's not wrong Mm -hmm. so i'm gonna let me come at what is an addiction from a biopsychosocial spiritual lens okay so i'm gonna say that an addiction by contrast with what you see here we're gonna do justice to the brain Mm -hmm. and to the Mm out-of-controlness of it Mm -hmm. um but I'm going to use this definition. An addiction is an intense habit, a behavior pattern involving compulsive use of a substance over time, resulting in an inability to quit despite adverse circumstances, adverse consequences. So um, how does an addiction happen? It occurs when your brain's reward system is hijacked, and causes you to crave and seek pleasure from sources that are ultimately harmful. Now, let me use an example we can all relate to, because what I'm trying to emphasize here is that rather than viewing addiction as something that a category of people have and mm-hmm. others don't, mm-hmm. that it's a uh, degree okay. that all of us are uh, susceptible to. I like that. Keep going. So I'm I'm articulating the developmental model of addiction right okay. here. And there's books that argue for this if you guys are nerds and want to check them out the biology of desire why addiction is not a disease is a book Mm -hmm. and then there's other books in that vein Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh think about remember how you felt the last time you experienced something really positive maybe it was acing a test maybe it was accomplishing a goal here's one that we can all relate to maybe it was eating a favorite dessert Mm -hmm. when you experience pleasure say you're eating a chocolate cake your brain releases a neurotransmitter a pleasure chemical called dopamine Mm -hmm. and this is released from the nucleus accumbens in your brain where you feel arousal and pleasure 
as well as a desire for more. So when dopamine is released in your brain, when you take a bite of chocolate cake, your brain is saying, pay attention to this. Like everything in Mm. you comes online in a state of arousal Mm. and your brain is recording this and saying, repeat this. When you experience something enjoyable, you want to repeat it. Mm -hmm. You want the enjoyment to continue. Mm -hmm. And so whatever dopamine uh, is associated with focuses your attention. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the brain is that neurons that fire together wire together. So picture your brain as kind of like a, when you're forming a habit as like a, uh, a rainforest Mm -hmm. with really thick foliage. And the first time you walk a path through a rainforest, it's pretty difficult to traverse because you're like pushing these branches over and blah, right. blah. Right. But if you, what happens if you keep walking that same path over and over and over and over again? It yeah. starts to break the branches. Sure. It starts to form ruts. Mm-hmm. It becomes easy to traverse. And like any habit, um, eventually it can be traveled unconsciously. Mm-hmm. Anyone who has driven the same route to or from work or to or from home Mm -hmm. and then move somewhere else Mm -hmm. has found themselves at (laughs) the wrong destination because they were on autopilot. Your brain formed this rut Mm. where it could travel that path Mm -hmm. without thinking. Mm -hmm. And think about how difficult life would be if you had to consciously think about everything you were doing. You'd never get anything done. You'd be exhausted. So 70% of our day is automatic. Okay. And so what I'm arguing in the developmental model of addiction Mm -hmm. is that the dopamine that's released when you experience uh, alcohol, drugs, sex, Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the highest boosts of dopamine you can get. And everything comes online, your brain, I I could go into detail, but it hyper remembers that. Right. And then as you continue to go throughout your life, Mm -hmm. you experience something and your brain reminds you, hey, this will make you feel better. Mm -hmm. So you have some kind of distress and you're like, you know what? Uh, A cigarette would take away that edge. Give me a little break. Right. Oh, you know what? Uh, Some beer right now would make me feel better. This Mm -hmm. porn will give me an escape. Mm -hmm. So some agent, drugs, alcohol, sex, et cetera, sugar, becomes a means of transcendence Mm -hmm. i don't like this circumstance Mm -hmm. i'm gonna use this to get me above and out of Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. but when you do that you're wiring your brain to travel that path and the more that you go to those things to to handle life Mm -hmm. the more pathways that are formed and what happens is is that uh to land the plane and get a little discussion here the part of your brain that uh it's called the um the limbic system Mm -hmm. it starts to view getting high getting a buzz getting that dopamine Mm -hmm. and those high unnatural doses Mm -hmm. it starts to view that as a survival issue so that there's a tolerance effect Mm -hmm. you need more of it to Mm -hmm. accomplish the same thing and not being in that state becomes uh fight or flight Mm. like your 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 limbic system starts firing and saying i'm dying Mm -hmm. if i'm not in that high state Mm -hmm. of pleasure Mm -hmm. and so without realizing it a person is making themselves less and less capable of handling life on life's terms Mm. instead of being happy with the ups and downs Mm -hmm. they need huge ups okay and so life becomes harder okay and uh and the addiction becomes more and more entrenched and the person is adding links into the chain that lead them to the place where hopefully, like you started us off with today, Jesus says, I'm here mm-hmm. to set you free. Mm-hmm. Now, what is the biggest difference between the first definition that you shared and what you just shared right there? Okay. So the explanation by saying it's primarily a chronic relapsing brain disease okay. that highlights that this is something that um is primarily outside of a person's ability to influence okay um and so what i'm trying to say is is that it's we need to look at it holistically Mm -hmm. yes uh you can be born into a home like i was where there was a lot of addiction in your past and Mm -hmm. that has influenced you so that you can experience that pathway 
formation faster yep. and more quick that makes sense. and, and mm-hmm. more intensely, but it doesn't lead you to believe that there's no hope. Gotcha. And gotcha. in fact, it actually makes traveling that pathway more serious because you're like, wait a minute, every time that I do this, I am hardwiring myself to go that direction Mm -hmm. and i am hardwiring myself to interpret life without that as Mm -hmm. unbearable Mm -hmm. and i am adding links into the chain that eventually i'm going to need removed from me Mm -hmm. and i'm making i'm going deeper into death okay banquet in the grave yes this is great but i am in a grave surrounded by the stench of death and i need to get out of here yeah it creates urgency right right so a person, um, and, and it might be a listener right now, uh, and, and you know, know that if this is um, like uh, resonating with your heart and your mind and your story, uh, and you're maybe new to the podcast, uh, man, I love that you're here. We love that you're here. We, we've prayed that you'd, you'd hang out and, and, and listen in. So a person uh, begins to walk this path. It's not well-formed yet. And over time and repetition, it not only gets well formed, but then your body starts to believe that's not just a joyful place for me to go. Like, I can't live without it. That might be quicker for you than it is for me, potentially based on our disposition and, and some of those things that you just said, like genetically and things like that. But, but um, we still have, we still have, um, it's, a, it's a few dynamics at play. There is, there's the genetic dynamic at play, but then there's also the, the choice and the fact that I continue to pull this trigger and, and make this path a well-worn path based on the choices that I'm looking, um, where I'm looking for my satisfaction, where I'm looking for my escape. So I'm on the path. I'm, I'm realizing like I'm in trouble. What, what, what do I do? What's, what's next? Well, um, we'll look at it from two verses uh, real quickly. One is John chapter 8, beginning in verse 34. Um, just to give you a little back up a little bit, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And when you think of a disciple, think of an apprentice. This is like someone who is learning to take on the lifestyle practices skills character Mm -hmm. of their rabbi Mm -hmm. you are truly my disciples if you abide in my word and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free they answered him we're offspring of abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone how is it that you say you will become free so he's talking to a group of people who were really moral Mm -hmm. they were elite Mm -hmm. in that culture for uh having and upholding and maintaining really high standards that Mm -hmm. everyone else couldn't even attain. Right. And he looks at them and he says, you're slaves. And they're like, what? Yeah. They're offended. And talking to me. Yeah. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. And when he would say that in that culture, that was saying, what I'm saying is incontestable. This is beyond dispute. And I'm telling it to you with authority. Okay. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin Mm -hmm. is a slave to sin. Mm -hmm. So, let me get this right. Hang on. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And so what you are being told is that not all addictions are sin. So... You can have a, a compulsive pattern in your life that's actually really good because that's the way we're wired. Mm-hmm. God, it's not by accident that dopamine is there mm-hmm. to dial in your attention mm-hmm. to what feels good. Mm-hmm. We were made for pleasure. Mm-hmm. God has given us a beautiful world, mm-hmm. resplendent with glory. Mm-hmm. He's given us taste buds. He's given us pleasure sensors. He's given us dopamine all to hardwire us for the ultimate satisfaction Mm. possible. Mm. And so our desires, as I said before, are not too too strong. Mm -hmm. They're too weak. So not all addictions are sin, but all sin is addiction. Okay, keep going. And so we're going to see that here, Mm -hmm. and then we're going to see it again in James 1. Okay. But Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin 
is a slave to sin. So anytime we do anything against God, against others, against our conscience, it's because there is a pleasure that we can't say no to. Mm -hmm. And so that pattern of this is not good for me, but I have to have it. Mm -hmm. Um, What the heart wants, the will chooses compulsively and the mind justifies. So Mm -hmm. this is like that person who goes on a lifestyle diet or something Mm -hmm. and says, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to a party tonight. They're going to have all this food. I'm going to resist because I have this goal. I want to look great for this wedding. Sure. And they get there and they get in the presence of that food. And all of a sudden the siren call of instant gratification begins. And there's this colossal tug of war Yeah. where help me not do what I want to do. Right. And, uh, what usually happens is is that we start bargaining with ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, because our mind is starting to say, this is too hard. I have to make it right. not look as bad. And so Jesus is saying, anytime you sin, it's because you're a slave to sin. And what he's saying is every human being on the planet mm. is a slave to sin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then remember, he promised that this is leading to the truth that will set you free. What's he say next? The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. What is he saying? He's saying that this world, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but Mm -hmm. that the world might be saved through them. So um, I remember a friend of mine got out of prison, and uh, I went to pick him up and take him somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, man, you know, like, how you doing, blah, 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 and after a little while, it's like, hey, so how's your uh, your drug problem going? Are you still abstaining, mm-hmm. staying away, mm-hmm. blah, blah? He's like, drug problem? What drug problem? As long as I have drugs, there's no problem. Right, right. And, uh, and that casual remark mm-hmm. made me nervous because he has spent most of his life in prison. Yeah. And he's told me, I will never go back. Mm-hmm. But that siren call mm-hmm. of drugs... He's he's been in prison now for another ten years, and mm-hmm. he still has ten or fifteen more to go. Mm-hmm. So, but that prison that he's in, as tragic as that is, Jesus is saying all human beings okay. are born slaves mm-hmm. with misdirected desires that are too easily pleased, mm. and that unless there is an intervention, okay. we will willingly, voluntarily choose slavery to anything over the real God. Right. And we will redefine that Hmm. real God in our own image Mm -hmm. to tell us what we want to hear because all lies are a narcotic. Mm -hmm. They take away the edge. They make it easier to sin without exposure. Okay, so our hearts are our hearts are misdirected. They're they're going to be prone to chase hard after sin. We are going to then justify that in our minds. We're gonna we're, we're gonna be meaning makers. We're gonna be storytellers, and we're going to eventually get what we want. So it seems as though we need to change what we want. But then there's that there's a problem because like how, how do we change what we want? But I'm starting to hear a solution. I'm starting to hear like use the word intervention. Talk talk to me a little bit about okay. So so really. I know this is how my mind's going to work. I need I need my heart's desires to be set on something different. Talk to me a little bit about that intervention and and wh- where is there hope in the midst of like this slavery? Amen. So Jesus again with verse thirty five of John chapter eight says the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So remember John three seventeen. Nobody memorizes that, but they should. <laughs> Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that mm. the world might be saved through them. So the main reason that people turn to an addiction and it becomes a compulsion and voluntary slavery Mm -hmm. is because it's their solution. Okay. They are turning to it to transcend, to escape, to get out of their reality because Mm -hmm. their reality feels unbearable. It Mm -hmm. feels out of control. Mm -hmm. And so that drug, that alcohol, that sex, that person, whatever, gives them a feeling of transcendence. Mm-hmm. I can escape mm-hmm. even for a little while, yeah. and that is worth everything. Right. And so Jesus is saying, God loved the world, this world, so much that instead of us having to earn our way to God, 
God came to us to say that you could never do that. Mm -hmm. Like you're voluntary slaves. I'm here to rescue Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And so instead of you just need to open your hands, you need to admit, I am a voluntary slave to these patterns. I cannot Mm. rescue myself. Mm. And so Jesus says, here's the hope. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. What's he saying? He's saying that there's a day coming where everything that's wrong is going to be made right. Mm -hmm. But if that happens without my intervention, Jesus says, it's going to go bad for you because everyone here is a sinner. Mm -hmm. They're a slave Mm -hmm. of sin, a Mm -hmm. voluntary slave of sin, and they don't want a savior. Mm -hmm. So what's the solution? Jesus says, the son does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Mm -hmm. The great exchange. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So Jesus is God coming to human history, the rich becoming poor, Mm -hmm. so that by his poverty we can be made rich. The righteous becoming unrighteous, so that by his substitutionary death, Mm -hmm. he exchanges places with us. He lived the life we could never live, loving God and man perfectly on our behalf. He perfectly worshiped God, Mm -hmm. kept him first in everything, and he perfectly loved others Mm -hmm. selflessly until the end. Even on the cross, he's thinking about his mom, he's thinking about his enemies, he's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. He loved perfectly. Human history is divided by that love because Mm -hmm. no one else has Mm -hmm. come close. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't just dying as an example. He was dying in our place for our sin, for our addiction, Mm. for our exchange of God for that substitute. Mm -hmm. And so when we admit, God, I'm sorry for loving my pleasure more than you, more than my family, more than others, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Even just that confession Mm. that admission to god vertically Mm. means that god is calling you Mm. and then jesus's death in your place for your sin happens once for all Mm -hmm. and when you buy something you get a what so that somebody tries to say hey you stole that receipt the receipt and so what's the proof that you've paid for something in full the receipt and Mm -hmm. so jesus is dying for our sins on the third day he rose from the grave why because there was nothing left mm. to be done, mm-hmm. paid in full to tell us, die, mm. it is finished. And mm. so Jesus overcame sin, which separates us from God, and he overcame death, which is the penalty for sin. Mm-hmm. He paid it in full, mm-hmm. and the resurrection is the proof that you can come to him, mm. be forgiven, leave your old life behind, mm-hmm. and embrace a new existence that will go on forever and ever and ever with God and for him mm-hmm. and others. Mm-hmm. And that he will progressively set you free from every competing affection, Mm. every competing love. Mm. And slowly pry open your hands. Jesus said, it's not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. Mm. I did not come for the righteous. Mm -hmm. I came for those who know that they are so broken, so messed up, so lost, so hopeless. Mm -hmm. They have no other shot. So you're telling me that... That the gospel which you just described is both an initial intervention into our slavery and then an ongoing intervention into our slavery. Can you flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, so um, whenever we sin, let's go ahead and turn to James 1 real fast. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Okay, James chapter 1 says this is Jesus's half brother mm-hmm. but he identifies himself as a slave of God in Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. He didn't do that before Jesus' resurrection. Right. He was like that guy yeah. what? Yeah, who's who is this guy? But after seeing Jesus alive, he's mm-hmm. like I'm not his brother, I'm his slave. Yeah. So, all right. It says let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. He himself tempts no one. Verse 14. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. You know, you fisher people, you people that love fishing, those fish see that bait. Mm-hmm. And even though they see their boy and their homeboy and their mm-hmm. homegirl get taken up, yep. they're like, I have to have yeah. that. Bite down, gets it in there. 
tempted by his own desire. Then when desire is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. When sin is conceived. So when we place ourselves in the desi- in our desire's arms, mm-hmm. because we love what they offer more than anything else, mm-hmm. more than our family, more than God, more than anything, the result is death. Mm-hmm. But when we believe the gospel... Um, Jesus comes in and begins to progressively set us free. And so just like there's a progression into addiction, Mm -hmm. there is a progression in discipleship Mm -hmm. to Jesus where you progressively become more fully human, more fully alive, Mm -hmm. more fully content. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for it. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your soul. So image and then you can jump in when we hold a ball underwater in the pool Mm -hmm. it's restless yeah because it wants to go where it belongs right and you're forcing it down so jesus is saying with we're voluntary slaves of sin that we voluntarily suppress the truth about god that we need a savior Mm -hmm. and that even after coming to him yeah that we desperately need him every second for everything but the process of growing in grace is the process of increasingly experiencing rest no matter what's going on mm-hmm. externally. So I'll let you jump in and, and kind of draw it out more, but um, it's going to be a battle, and I, maybe I'll land the plane with this. Jesus said the meek inherit the earth. Mm-hmm. Relationships go better when we don't put ourselves first, mm-hmm. when we're kind and gentle mm-hmm. and flexible. But he said the kingdom of heaven is taken by force Mm -hmm. and the violent Mm -hmm. take it by force. So Mm -hmm. if we want to grow in discipleship, just like God, and this is offensive to a lot of people, but in the Old Testament, the Israelites had to drive out the inhabitants of Canaan. Mm -hmm. There's no more driving out physical inhabitants. Mm -hmm. It's it's dispossessing your heart of its idols. Okay of those competing saviors, those lover gods that are good things most of the time, yeah. but they're good things that we want too much, yeah. that we can't live without. And Jesus is saying, it's going to take violence. It's going to take exertion. It's going to feel like you're going up mm. a downward escalator mm-hmm. for you to grow and mm-hmm. to let go of those com- savior, those competing saviors. That's actually good news um, for those who struggle uh, because I think sometimes... We need uh, two things. We need permission to battle, and we need uh, possibility that we can change. And um, so I want to go back to the pool and the image that you gave. We're pushing down the ball. It, it, wants, to, it wants to go. That, like, that, like that's, um, you said that that was a picture of our voluntary slavery. So how do we get out of the way? How do we, how do we stop doing that and start um, becoming more surrendered to finding our pleasures in Jesus. Yeah, so um, this is the paradox. This is the irony. And um, we talked about it last time I was here. Mm-hmm. Is the uh, a plane can't fly without both wings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so those two wings in growth and sanctification, growth and grace, mm-hmm. growth in Christ, is 100% dependence, mm-hmm. 100% determination. Mm-hmm. So this road is going to involve let's start with people with addictions if somebody has a physical addiction to drugs or alcohol Mm -hmm. or porn or something like that they're going to need more radical intervention um until they stabilize Mm -hmm. um physically they've removed that thing and they've got some clean time Mm -hmm. so that their brain begins to rewire itself uh, and acclimate to life without the substance, yes. without the potion, the chemical cocktail. Mm-hmm. And um, as that happens, because of neuroplasticity, mm-hmm. the way God has wired our brain, you th- throw around the person a new community, mm-hmm. new rhythms, mm-hmm. new routines mm-hmm. that gradually lift that beached ship when the when the water comes in so that it can eventually begin to go out and be free. And so what happens is over time, very incrementally and slowly, we will start to grow Mm -hmm. as we submit to these routines Mm -hmm. 
of loving and worshiping Jesus, being in the scriptures, serving, being in community, knowing and being known, Mm -hmm. we will gradually, slowly, disjointedly rewire our brains and also sensitize our souls to God himself Mm. so that we are now grieved by very, very small things in the Mm -hmm. world's eyes, but Mm -hmm. to us they're huge. (laughs) Right. Right. You know, um, I could give examples, um, but uh, as far as the holding the water down, yeah. where I was going with resolution and determination, de- mm-hmm. dependence and determination mm-hmm. is the first three steps of the 12 steps, the first three steps of the Beatitudes, Matthew 5. I can't do this, you can, Jesus, I surrender. Mm. I can't do this, you can, I surrender. So as you're taking your next step of obedience, wherever you are, listener and friend, mm-hmm. Take a step of obedience. Why do we get accountability? We get it for things that we can't do on our own. <laughs> right. So come into the light. First uh, John 1 says, come into the light. Live in the light. Mm-hmm. So when a person removes the thing of addiction mm-hmm. and gets in the light mm-hmm. and then schedules their whole life in the light, mm-hmm. then gradually they will find themselves walking with rest Mm. because once we're fully come we've come clean we've confessed Mm -hmm. i've been hiding i've been lying whenever we're hiding and lying we're placing a separation from others and our soul knows that's not supposed to be that way right but it's the ball is put at rest when we just come clean and say i've been messing up Uh. i want to take responsibility i want to clean my side of the street if you've done some really jacked up things, get some counsel from some wise people about mm. how to bring your stuff into the light because mm-hmm. you don't want to just shatter. Right. All sin hurts others. Right. Um, but I think as we're seeing with Ravi Zacharias right mm-hmm. now in the news, mm-hmm. I have every belief that that guy met Jesus at some point mm-hmm. and had a genuine encounter with his love. Mm-hmm. But he must have compromised at some point. Mm-hmm and lied to himself right and gradually hardened his conscience sure so that he went deeper and deeper into that banquet in the grave mm. so that we look back at his life and we're like how did that guy do that right for decades while he's doing ministry right. well sin is placed in the world friends so that you would know that the world is in you so what he did is egregious and reprehensible mm-hmm. and needs to be decried and yes not all of us are out there uh, sexually abusing people, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but do not minimize your sin because mm-hmm. we, Jesus said, are voluntary slaves to our sin patterns. Mm-hmm. They work, mm-hmm. and so wherever in your life that you are minimizing and bargaining and excusing your sin and hiding in the dark, mm-hmm. look at Ravi Zacharias. Look at how mm-hmm. offensive it is to the world what he's done, mm-hmm. and say sin is placed in the world so that I would know the world is in me. As offensive as that sin is to the world, mm-hmm. my sin is to God. Mm-hmm. And if I keep on mocking him mm-hmm. and hiding this sin, eventually I will be exposed even more publicly than he is now mm-hmm. because God says that everything that is now private yeah. will be 100% visible. Right. So fear God now and let that ball come up and be honest and get in the light and live in the light and you will slowly move forward. Not to earn God's love, Mm -hmm. but because you're loved. Mm -hmm. If you know that you need a savior, do not interpret that as condemnation. That is the God of the universe saying, you are my child Mm -hmm. and you're in danger and I love you. Mm -hmm. Listen to my voice and come to Jesus and come to my people. Right. So then, um, as, as we just kind of wrap it up and bring it to a close, plan of action. I mean, I, I feel like I've been hearing you talk about the plan of action, but sum that up for the listener to just, oh, be like, okay, I hear what you're saying. You know, we're as sick as our secrets. Plan of action, John, go. So the 12 steps, uh, think of a, a stone dropping, and it ripples outward. The first three steps are getting right with God vertically. Mm-hmm. I can't, you can, I surrender. Mm-hmm. Third step, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So get right with God first. Mm-hmm. And then the next ripple out from peace with God is peace with self. Mm-hmm. That's where you take a, a ruthless moral inventory mm-hmm. and learn how to get all your stuff out into the light mm-hmm. and share it with a safe person. Mm-hmm. 
one on one or in mm-hmm. a very small group. Mm-hmm. And then peace with God leads to peace with self. Rippling out leads to peace with others, where you begin to go and say, "All right, who are the people that I've harmed?" Mm-hmm. And you go and you try to make amends mm-hmm. and get help with this because. Uh, the longer we're in sin, the less aware we are of the impact we're having on mm. others. So even going and trying to make things <laughs> right, we need guidance right. because we can really make things worse. Right. And I need, we all need it. Sure. So get, get that help and make things right with others. Sure. And then the fourth ripple out is carrying the message. Mm-hmm. And so being discipled, being trained in your local church, in the rhythms of the gospel, mm up in out of uh biblical literacy mm-hmm. gospel fluency missional uh skill you mm-hmm. know how to incarnate uh put flesh on skin on manifest the gospel the kingdom in our world and every person who hears this and is called to jesus you are sent into mm-hmm. your life mm-hmm. to be salt and light mm-hmm. salt retards decay mm-hmm. and meat and light uh it attracts attention, but it also dispels darkness. And so follow the Holy Spirit and and other wise friends and begin to bring the light of the kingdom, of justice, of social equality, mm-hmm. of, of love and kindness into where you live, work, and play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And do that in, in the church, talking about it, learning from others, being encouraged. Uh, Hebrews says to not neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but stimulate goad each other right. towards growth because church is not a club it's a crossfit mm-hmm. and when you go to a crossfit they are motivating each other mm-hmm. someone doesn't show up for a workout they're like where are you at bro mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so we need to be that way with each other because proverbs 18 1 says he who isolates himself seeks his own desire so mm-hmm. if any of you are listening to me and you are isolated you are just pray you are probably in the 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 lion's mouth Mm -hmm. and sheep are defenseless against uh against predators so come back into the light Mm -hmm. and follow those four movements Mm -hmm. vertical peace with god personally psychologically emotionally peace with self by moral inventory peace with others by cleaning up your relationships Mm -hmm. with help and then living on mission with increasing depth Mm -hmm. of holiness of gentleness, of counterintuitive grace and truth, so that we will not be ashamed when Jesus returns. And I love that. That's the plan of action. And there's um, so good. And there's there's also like um, a context in which that best happens. And so you'll hear often um, from you know AA in the program. You know, um, go to meetings, get a sponsor. Um, you know, work the steps. And, uh, and, the, and then obviously as part of the, the steps is, is giving it away. And so uh, that's a great translation, both for somebody who, um, where that is applicable and, you know, they find themselves um, in the midst of an addiction that, you know, maybe we started off talking about, um, drugs and alcohol, things like that. But it's also applicable to all of us who suffer from addiction, um, even if it's not quite to the same severity of um, consequence as drugs and alcohol the 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 con the contexts are the same so go to meetings be in community you have to be in community so the plan of action works but it's going to work best when you're in community and have accountability around you get a sponsor so not only be in community but also find yourself in um, uh, an inner circle of safety of people who know jesus know you and are willing to f- accept you in right where you are, but not leave you there. And um, and then you know work work the steps, work the program. That's an invitation into the the journey of discipleship. Um, and and so I think that um, is a is a great plan of action. And then context for where that plan gets gets worked out. And so we're gonna we're gonna end our episode there. I think that uh, hopefully you guys have had um, a, a great survey in the problem of addiction, how it works, what is it? We talked about those pathways. The solution is we we need an intervention outside of ourselves, both um, initially in our salvation, but then in our ongoing sanctification. You know, we get sanctified, we get made holy, we get set free the same way we initially got forgiven. Is is by the intervention of Christ in our in our our uh, bringing a gift of desperation to Him, and then um, the plan of action. This is this is what it looks like uh, to begin to walk out your healing and your and your freedom. And 
So uh, big thanks for John, for Joy, for their family being able to rearrange for you to come come out today. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you to Frankie, our producer, who's making all things awesome here. We love you guys and uh, look forward to the show next week. Hope you enjoy and have a great week. <laughs>